Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Ambusky from the Washington Library Center for Digital History. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. We've got a great program in store for you as we'll be talking with Dr. Marcus Nevius about the Great Dismal Swamp. Before we dive in, however, I do want to alert you about a couple of upcoming events. I encourage you to join us on February the 18th for the USC George Washington Leadership Lecture, which is co-sponsored by the University of Southern California's Saul Price School of Public Policy. You'll have the chance to hear from Richard Haas, who is the president of the Council of Foreign Relations, and my friend and colleague, Dr. Abby Mullen, who is a professor at George Mason University on the diplomatic challenges of Washington's era. And on March 2nd, Join us right back here at 7 p.m. Eastern for my chat with Dr. Tamika Nunley of Oberlin College. She's the, excuse me, she's the author of a just published book at the threshold of liberty, women, slavery, and shifting identities in Washington, D.C. You can find more about these upcoming talks and uh, all of our additional talks by going to www.mountvernon.org slash GW Digital Talks. All right, so I'm very excited about tonight's conversation with my friend, Dr. Marcus Nevius. We're going to be talking about the Great Dismal Swamp. And despite its name, the Great Dismal Swamp is anything but dismal. It's a national wildlife refuge currently. It's a perfect uh, place for outdoor recreation. It's great for social distancing. But in the 18th and 19th centuries, it was the site of intense interest on the part of corporations and investors like George Washington, who hoped to make the land into something more productive. But it was also the site for enslaved people who labored on that land and to make who struggled to make that vision a reality. And the swamp itself became a kind of city of refuge. And to help us understand what this all means, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Marcus Nevius, Assistant Professor of History at the University of Rhode Island. He's a recent Washington Library Research Fellow. He's the author of the new book, City of Refuge, Slavery and Petite Marinage in the Great Dismal Swamp, 1763 to 1856, which has been recently published by U the University of Georgia Press. Dr. Nevius, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us this evening. Jim, thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to uh, join you this evening. Well, I'm, I'm very excited to have you. I, I love talking to you. And, and I, am I correct in assuming that you are coming uh, to us from Rhode Island right now? I am indeed dry, but there's snow outside. <laughs> and I imagine there's probably more on the forecast. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, send some down this way because we don't get enough. Uh, you know, as, uh, as we get started here, I do want to remind our friends in the audience that you'll have a chance to ask questions uh, of Dr. Nevius in the second half of today's program. And by asking a question, we've got a great deal for you tonight, because if you ask a question, you, you'll be entered to win a free copy of Marcus's book. So Juan's at the ready, everybody. And if you do, even if you don't win, you can purchase a copy of, of his book from the University of Georgia Press via the link we're gonna drop in the comments. But Marcus, let's get started. Let's talk about this fascinating place. And I thought we would begin by doing a little world building for the audience and talking about the Great Dismal Swamp as a place. Can you, can you describe this place to us? What is it and what does it encompass and, and uh, what, how should we understand it as a physical environment? Sure. Uh, thank you for that question, first of all. Um, we should really think about the Great Dismal Swamp as the environmental wonder that it is. Um, as you see here uh, in these maps, uh, it covers a considerable geographic space and covered even, an even larger geographic space in the uh, 19th, 18th, and uh, previous centuries prior to uh, post-Civil War uh, logging enterprises, which really uh, drained the landscape significantly and changed uh, the way it looks. As you mentioned, it's uh, today a national wildlife refuge uh, administered by the United States Wildlife Service uh, in most of its sectors, and then in a smaller uh, parcel, which is actually more than 14,000 acres, uh, a North Carolina state park, which offers ready access to uh, the Dismal Swamp Canal from US Highway 17 in North Carolina, if I'm remembering my highway numbers correctly. Uh, but uh, prior to the Civil War, this was very much a wild refuge, a landscape in which uh, black bears and uh, uh, cougars and uh, other forms of mammals and wildlife uh, called home. It was a place that was very much characterized by the natural uh, e ecological life cycles of the, the plants and animals which lived within it. And it was very much animated by uh, the insects and arachnids too, which 
uh, find homes in it. At its center uh, is Lake Drummond, which is about a 3,000 acre circular natural uh, uh, lake, which is no more than 10 feet deep uh, at its deepest points, and which was often utilized for its very rich waters, uh, which are filtered by the significant peaty soils uh, and have some level of acidity to it, which uh, in the 19th century especially was seen as being good for human health. Uh, to enter the swamp was to either find a path that was man-made or mm -hmm. was to essentially hack through the underbrush, uh, depending upon which entry point uh, one selected, uh, in order to uh, find a way from the east, west, north, or south to the lake in the middle. Um, and it's uh, wildlife, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's plants mm -hmm. and trees included a wide range of pine species, uh, cypress species, uh, and juniper species as well. So it sounds like a beautiful place, but also a kind of formidable place. And, and uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about what people like Washington were trying to make of it here in a second. But one of the other things I wanted to get on the table is this idea of marinage, this term that is an important part of, of your book and an important part of the entire argument of your book. Can you help us understand what that means? Sure. So uh, I see marinage essentially as the most pervasive form of slave resistance uh, mm -hmm. through the entire history of slavery, especially in the Atlantic world. Uh, it was essentially initiated when enslaved people escaped and took advantage of proximate refuges, refuges that were close uh, to slave societies, plantations, other zones of slavery. Uh, but they claimed landscapes uh, in small groups or in some cases in really large groups uh, and used the landscape to uh, remain in hiding or to resist being captured. Uh, the term itself has significant um, scholarly roots uh, mm -hmm. as anthropologists and sociologists who were working in the Caribbean and in South America, in places like Brazil and Suriname, uh, studying descendants of enslaved people who hid in proximate landscapes uh, to designate the cultures uh, that these scholars encountered. Uh, and it happened primarily in two significant contexts. Uh, uh, contexts in which significant large numbers mm -hmm. escaped uh, to proximate landscapes such that these large numbers were able to fend off even the most well-organized military forces, as was the case in Brazil in the 17th century and Jamaica in the 18th century, in smaller instances, but in no less important instances in places like Cuba, Panama, uh, and the southern United States as well. What fascinates me about the term is that, you know, we're also accustomed to thinking about sort of that grand scale marinage that you were talking about just a moment ago, you know, in Jamaica or Brazil, those kinds of places that that uh, I often get, uh, I guess, the headlines, you might say. They certainly did in the 18th century. Are there other sites in North America and what becomes the United States where we see the kind of marinage, the petite marinage, as you describe it, taking place as well besides the Great Dismal Swamp? Absolutely. Uh, the Florida Peninsula is a significant, both the Florida Peninsula and the Panhandle, frankly, uh, are significant zones of 18th, 19th century marinage. Uh, the Louisiana Cypress Swamps are another zone of significant maroon activity. Uh, and to be sure, this, uh, this, this context of maroon activity uh, hews closely to the history and the scholarship of slave flight as well. Uh, but I think it's an interesting interpretive move or framing to think about marinage when we're thinking about slave flight because it places the emphasis, emphasis of the action uh, on uh, perhaps the intent or at least the record of the actions of enslaved people who sought to repudiate slavery. And so there are many places where we can look, where we can find swamps, Mississippi, for example, uh, where small groups of enslaved people hid out and might have been advertised as runaways on the one hand uh, in, in primary source materials that we might read today, mm -hmm. but they were acting very much as Maroons elsewhere did. Well, I'm excited to talk more about how they made sense of that place and how they used that space to their advantage here in a moment. 
Uh, but let's first, I think, maybe look at what people like, you know, Anglo-Americans Anglo like Washington are, are hoping to achieve in this space. Why do they see a place that has the word dismal in its name as a site of intense interest? What do they hope they can make it become? So uh, Washington's generation in the 1760s, including Washington himself, mm -hmm. were first interested in the swamp's water table and in its very rich soils. They saw in uh, this landscape two key opportunities. The first was to uh, secure a title uh, in Virginia's land offices uh, and county uh, by the signature and verification of county clerks such that they might hold on to significant land tracts and that would potentially uh, attract uh, future buyers. And in this way, the, uh, one of the key focuses in the 1760s was to secure the purchase of a 40,000 acre land tract, which essentially covered most of what is today the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, uh, activities that weren't fully secured in the Virginia courts, by the way, until well after uh, the American Revolution. Uh, but in holding these lands uh, and in advance of perhaps securing buyers, uh, their, their attentions in the 1760s turned to perhaps identifying zones in the Great Dismal Swamp that might have been uh, useful for the production of rice and hemp. And in this way, uh, Washington headed the project of attempting to establish dismal plantation uh, in the uh, early 1760s, such that by 1764, the first uh, group of 54 enslaved people were dispatched to this zone of the Great Dismal Swamp in an attempt to establish a rice and hemp plantation uh, and a site near to it uh, that would provide access into the swamp. Uh, that enterprise failed rather miserably, uh, as I, as I uh, detail in City of Refuge, and, uh, mainly because, at least in my view, of Black resistance, but also because the Great Dismal Swamp just uh, really wasn't suited, uh, at least with the technology that the Washington generation brought to bear in the 1760s uh, for rice or hemp cultivation on any grand scale. And so uh, with the interregnum, interregnum <laughs> I should say, of the American Revolution aside, uh, increasingly the corporate uh, land interests and company interests turned to uh, another of the swamp's very abundant resources, those resources being trees. Mm -hmm. What strikes me as really interesting is that we often think about uh, you know, colonists in this period turn citizens of the United States looking westward, you know, looking to the lands of the Ohio country. I mean, Washington in particular had a bunch of land out there uh, that he, he could claim as consequence of his service in the Seven Years' War. But here we have an instance where uh, they find still worlds to conquer in the East, and they're not done yet, in a sense, there. Um, it, and I think if we can pull up just a, one more time that uh, wonderful image right, we have right there, I think this is uh, George Washington's accounting of his acreage in 1794. It looks like he owns about 4,000 acres uh, there in the Great Dismal Swamp. Indeed. Uh, he and several other shareholders, they numbered uh, between 10 and 12 in the 1760s uh, and fewer uh, after the American Revolution, each divided equally, uh, or at least according to uh, the amount of investment they were willing to put into the company. Uh, the parcels of land that they might hold in corporate interest uh, by uh, through the auspices of the Dismal Swamp Company and its uh, later iteration, uh, the Dismal Swamp Land Company. I should actually mention here, too, that uh, Washington divested himself of his shares of the company in the 1780s uh, as he turned his attentions increasingly to um, really retirement in Mount Vernon. <laughs> this is prior to uh, his uh, two terms as the first United States president. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in 1785, he divested himself of his interests in the Dismal Swamp. So what role does enslaved labor play in this space? How did they, these corporations, these private investors use enslaved people to achieve their objectives? So enslaved labor was to be the very engine that would produce the profits the companies speculated. Uh, to put it very bluntly, uh, 
uh, the, from the very first group of enslaved people dispatched to the swamp in the 1760s through these several hundred uh, in, at any given time in any year in the uh, post-War of 1812 era, and especially in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, up to the Civil War, uh, these land companies were essentially dispatching enslaved people into the swamp to build its infrastructure, to cut and mill its trees, uh, to dig its ditches, to maintain those ditches, and to maintain the wooden plank roads uh, and other forms of swamp infrastructure necessary to move about uh, what essentially becomes the profitable uh, uh, product of the swamp, which are uh, pine boards and cypress boards uh, and pine boards and cypress staves, uh, barrel staves, and the like. Uh, they accomplished this feat by a number of devices. Initially, the company managers of the 18th century would acquire enslaved people by various means, uh, by purchase, by uh, exchange, so on and so forth, and send them into the swamp to essentially be compelled to do the company's bidding. Uh, and then increasingly in the 19th century, the uh, company managers uh, sort of moved away from a direct investment in uh, slave labor in the swamp uh, and turned instead to renting uh, enslaved people uh, from local uh, enslavers uh, and then sending those enslaved people into the swamp to do uh, the company's bidding. The problem was that enslaved people didn't cooperate much at all uh, with these efforts, although over time the companies were able to produce uh, sizable halls in terms of wooden shingle staves and the like. But enslaved people at every turn, as one can read in the many uh, primary sources the company has left us to examine, uh, resisted being taken advantage of as much as they possibly could. Perhaps the most famous example of this uh, is captured in the slave narrative, or the ex-slave narrative, I should say, that Moses Grandy penned, and that began circulating in the early United States and in Great Britain mm -hmm. after 1843 and 44, uh, in which he describes very, very, in very, very good detail, the uh, arduous labors that enslaved people were compelled to do, but also in way the ways in which they resisted. Uh, 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 the most egregious, perhaps, of abuses when they could. Let's talk about those forms of resistance because you've titled your book City of Refuge, and we've kind of hinted at, at what that means thus far, but can you tell us more about what it meant for this space to be a city of refuge for enslaved people? Sure. So the, the, the City of Refuge title is sort of imbued with uh, religious connotations, especially taken into the context of the 19th century. Um, it calls to mind all manner of various uh, uh, contexts for, for salvation, for refuge, for freedom. Um, but in the particular context of the Great Dismal Swamp, uh, it very much meant the remote sites of the swamp away from the activity of slave labor camps that existed right up until the Civil War, where enslaved people could uh, gather uh, in small enough groups that they remained highly mobile and able to move about the various high uh, elevations of land locally known as hummocks, which were above the water table, but very difficult to access uh, when they were removed from the actual built infrastructure of the swamp. And so, uh, Part of the story of resistance, really the, 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 the connective tissue of the story of resistance that comes out in City of Refuge is in my attempts to uh, highlight where possible the uh, uh, known proximities of Maroons uh, near slave labor camps and the ways in which the actual proximity of those slave labor camps both functioned as sources of provisions for perhaps Maroon uh, camps hidden within the swamp, or also as uh, outlets for uh, boards and shingles that Maroons would cut and filter into those slave labor camps as well, in sort of a tacit exchange of of a very limited form of 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 
I, I don't want to call it freedom because it wasn't really freedom, but it was a, a limited form of not being directly harassed, let's say, by uh, the uh, land company agents in exchange for the production of, 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 of shingle staves, boards, and the like. So is it fair to say then that there was almost a kind of informal agreement that this in that this informal economy, this, these means of exchange would, would be permitted to take place as long as it advanced company interests in some form? I would say yes, and the, and the evidence certainly supports that. What else do we know about these informal economies? What, you know, are they ex exchanging, it sounds like provisions, are they, are, are people growing produce inside the swamp or are they sourcing provisions from outside to feed themselves? What does that look like? So uh, in, in my research, it was really difficult for me to conclude mm -hmm. uh, that the enslaved people, uh, especially in the 19th century, uh, as we neared the Civil War, were producing uh, provisions themselves in any significant fashion. Uh, the 18th century uh, evidence does uh, offer us a window into certain sectors of the swamp where evidence of, let's say, for example, um, uh, I'm thinking, not James Redpath, uh, uh, the name escapes me at the moment, uh, J.F.D. Smith, uh, who traveled in the region and um, observed certain zones of the swamp sector or, or the swamp region that seemed to have been tilled. Uh, but what we can find in the company records are is evidence of the, the sorts of provisions that were sent into the swamp to uh, uh, provision the slave labor camps that sometimes were not totally accounted for. And mm -hmm. these uh, provisions included uh, foods such as pork, lots of pork uh, in the records, uh, but also sometimes clothing and the like. Well, tell us more then about uh, what inspired you to write this book. Uh, it sounds like you're very fascinated in figuring out what was going on, what was slave life was like inside the Great Dismal Swap, but probably more profoundly than I would ma imagine that resistance was a powerful, motivating uh, intellectual question for you here. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so that story is sort of twofold and I'll, I'll try to keep it brief as, as I possibly can because I, as you know, really enjoy telling that story. Um, my father was very much involved in uh, a small corner of New Jersey, Princeton, uh, mm -hmm. in the local black community's effort to uh, resist uh, the impulse locally to conserve in a moment of momentous change. And his actual participation involved uh, being selected and being brave enough to enter a barbershop, a whites only, uh, a de facto whites only barbershop in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, and essentially after having grown an Afro say, uh, my grade of hair is, is loose enough. Uh, why don't you give me a haircut kind of thing? Uh, and the man that I met, because I was born much later, um, had, was, was a bit more subdued but he still sort of had that fire in mm -hmm. him that, that sort of he would stand up for what he believed was right. And I shouldn't say was as if he's not still with us. He is uh, um, in his elder years. Uh, I married that interest to the developing early academic interests that I gravitated toward as an undergraduate student at North Carolina Central University an HBCU, a historically black university uh, in Durham, North Carolina where I really engaged with a wide number of students who are ultimately my peers and the teacher scholar activists who introduced us to the very voluminous history of black resistance as they knew it. At this point, this is about the uh, early 2000s. And so I would travel about that part of North Carolina, the Piedmont, and back and forth, up down, up and down uh, Interstate 85 whenever I traveled uh, home to New Jersey. And I would look out of my window often and see the tall stands of pines that still exist in Southern Virginia and North Central North Carolina to this day. And I always had a nagging question that if slavery uh, was such a ubiquitous institution in all its forms, uh, but there was so much land here, even today, to that today being the early 2000s. Yeah. What would stop enslaved people from fleeing and hiding in these woods? 
And of course, that was a very elementary way to look at it as an undergraduate who probably had way too much gusto for, <laughs> uh, or at least I learned this after I actually started studying the subject. But the, the, the impetus was still there to turn my focus away from the plantation zones, which had been well studied, mm -hmm. or the urban zones, which uh, had been well studied, and to the rest of the landscape. And in doing that, uh, and in building my interest in black, res uh, not black resistance, I'm sorry, in, in slave flight, um, I began reading in Dr. Freddie Parker's uh, published works. Uh, he was on faculty at North Carolina Central at the time. And particularly in the edited volume of slave runway advertisements that he published with Garland Press uh, back in 1994, perhaps. Uh, and in that, I found what historians had already determined by, by the point that I was looking at this, that enslavers tended to note where they assumed enslaved people were trying to go. Huh. And one of those refrains was lurking about the neighborhood. And in my efforts to kind of understand that refrain lurking about the neighborhood uh, was born this idea, this interest, and ultimately this research that enslaved people often really remained really close to where they, they fled. They, the proximate landscapes uh, near where they were enslaved were, were sometimes just as useful as attempting to flee completely. Well, I love the story because it's such an important example of how, you know, our own personal experiences can inspire our research questions into the past. And, you know, I love that story about your dad. You know, that's, that's a very brave act. And so, you know, thank him for me if you ever get a chance. I, I want to know a little bit more about the sort of the nature of, of marinage, because as you as you said at the sort of top of the hour, it's a kind of, at least in the context we're talking about, a, a kind of transient uh, status, you know, it's a, it's not permanent like it was in Jamaica, but here there was a tendency to you know abscond into the into the swamp and then perhaps reappear. Or how does that process work? What does it look like? And is is that is that an acceptable form as we've kind of talked about already to the people who ostensibly own these individuals? That's a really good and insightful question. Uh, I'll take the the latter part of that question first. I think where uh, Maroon's movements in the Great Dismal Swamp served the interest of the land companies that sought to wrest the natural resources out of the swamp. Uh, I think where those interests intersected, uh, land company agents particularly were, were tacitly accepting of Maroon's movements. Mm -hmm. In other words, and perhaps put much more simply, where Maroon's were amenable to providing uh, timber staves and shingles, uh, they were often unmolested, or at least, uh, uh, I don't want to say ignored, but they, they were not pursued. That's that's the way to put it. Sure. Uh, and that, that's one of the major sort of premises that undergird City of Refuge. Uh, I think in other contexts uh, that apply to the Great Dismal Swamp, such as uh, around the uh, six weeks plus, uh, of the Nat Turner Rebellion, for example, where fears of enslaved uh, people's movements in the wilderness uh, are raised significantly. Mm -hmm. I think there are efforts to sort of rein in, if you will, uh, these Maroons' movements. And indeed, there are devices that uh, exist in the archive today which show us evidence of that, such as the county registers, which were created as an instrument of surveillance in uh, the wake of Nat Turner's rebellion and also in the wake of the Virginia Convention wow. of 1831-32, such that uh, in North Carolina, especially in the sub subsequent convention there, um, counties were required to keep registers of enslaved people who the companies dispatched into the swamp. Uh, and these registers recorded essentially uh, in the hand and observation of county clerks, mm -hmm. the vital statistics of enslaved people who were sent into the swamp, like their age, their skin tone, uh, their muscular sometimes uh, uh, disposition, uh, their height, uh, 
uh, uh, any distinctive scars such that if they did escape in a moment of, of unrest or such that they did not come out of the swamp when they were supposed to, they might be pursued. Uh, the problem with such registers is that only a few uh, remain for us to, to uh, investigate today. But the most comprehensive one uh, was kept, or the most comprehensive existing one was kept by Gates County, North Carolina. Uh, and its first pages date to 1847. Its last pages date to 1861. So it gives us a really good uh, range of years uh, to investigate the, uh, and really good records too, of, of the people who were enslaved by the Oropi Canal Company and other companies. Well, I love talking about sources, and it raises a question in my mind of how how we know what we know. And we've you know, you've already actually elaborated on some of that, you know, these registers and whatnot. But can you say something about the challenges of reconstructing enslaved life via these kinds of records? Because I imagine we're not getting uh, sources in their own voices, and so in a sense, it is a it was almost a function of pulling things inside out. I would imagine to get at those experiences. Absolutely, uh, mm -hmm. scholars are are recently developing. Uh, a significant methodological language by which we can describe these uh, archival source challenges, uh, tracing to the mid-1990s, perhaps before, uh, methods of reading archival silence, methods of reading against the bias grain of an archive, or sometimes reading with the bias grain of an archive to understand uh, the context in which one, uh, uh, an enslaved person operated, uh, these are the ways by which uh, scholars have begun to really investigate uh, what are essentially an archive in tatters, physical tatters. These are not the archives of, of wealthy statesmen, where I'm not using those, of course, um, which by virtue of the person or people who produced such records uh, were privileged, valued in such a way that they were preserved for posterity's sake. Some of the records that I encounter, a significant amount, frankly, part of the reason I was able to complete City of Refuge, were treated in such a way, such as company uh, economic records. Mm -hmm. uh, but in these, I was really uh, engaged in a method of reading beyond just the line items that helped me to understand what was produced in a certain quarter of 1837 by comparison to this a similar quarter in 1841 or what was produced in a certain month or what was provisioned into the swamp in a certain month or year to read the actual contextual notes that land company agents uh, uh, appended to these business reports. Uh, and I read them with great care uh, knowing that the uh, land company agents in particular were not that interested in uh, writing reams of information about what enslaved people were doing in the swamp. They were mostly there as a, an instrument of surveillance, company surveillance, to ensure and compel the enslaved people to labor in the way that the company saw fit. But in doing that, they often recorded uh, observations of enslaved people sometimes refusing to show up for labor on a Monday after a weekend, after a Sunday, I should say, uh, or in other instances of uh, enslaved laborers demanding certain provisions, such as rum, spirits, mm -hmm. uh, certain provisions such that uh, they might then turn to uh, the, the business of the swamp. And then finally, there's the traveler narratives that ultimately comprise uh, the broader uh, framing of City of Refuge, which, uh, as I'm sure we'll talk about in a moment, mm -hmm. yielded perhaps the very uh, brief mentions of, of, of maroons in the swamp as well. Well, I think it's great insight, and it's a great reminder too to always read footnotes. I mean, you were talking about those marginal notations, and I've, Marcus, as I've told you before, your footnotes are fantastic. And so, if, if folks out there are fans of footnotes or want to 
really good overview of uh, of scholarship on slavery for the past 30 years. You know, check out this book, which also reminds me that if you want to win a copy of Marcus's book, please do get your question in the comments. Uh, we'll be coming to your questions here in just a moment. But I do want to turn as you were as you were gesturing there to the themes of of the the middle 19th century when there's great ab or great agitation for abolitionism. The the Great Dismal Swamp and the enslaved people there become a kind of a fixture for the abolitionist community. Can you talk a little bit about the ways in which the the swamp featured in discussions about uh, resistance, about uh, freedom seekers, as I think you say in the book, of self-emancipation and and ultimately the abolitionist movement itself? Sure, sure. Uh, so some of the earliest evidence of the ways in which uh, the burgeoning 19th century abolitionist uh, communities, I should say plural, uh, pointed to the example of the Great Dismal Swamp, traced to the 1820s. Uh, an article titled uh, Slaves in the Dismal Swamp circulated in Boston uh, be, uh, sometime between 1823 and 1828. I was unable to pin down a direct uh, year in a circular called the Zion's Herald, uh, which pointed to the fact that despite uh, the going knowledge, the common knowledge that slavery was going to uh, die a slow and natural death uh, in Virginia, that new zones for slavery's expansion were opening up in places like the Great Dismal Swamp. And that particular uh, article came to my attention, not because I was some uh, highly astute historian who was poking about some random archive uh, in, in Boston, but because in 1848, Frederick Douglass actually reprinted this article in the North Star. It appeared in March 1848, I believe, and he reprinted it basically uh, in, in full. By the early 1850s, uh, others had come into uh, attempting to make an example of the Great Dismal Swamp. One such abolitionist was Edmund Jackson, also in Boston, who had visited, at least by his own estimation, uh, Southern Virginia, uh, and, and frankly, Mount Vernon too, uh, attempting to uh, reenact the pilgrimage that many white men of his generation had done. Uh, about 20 years before, he wrote an article that was published in a Boston uh, pamphlet called The Liberty Bell. That article was titled, The Virginia Maroons. Mm. And in this article, he began by explaining that the Great Dismal Swamp was the site of a number of swamp merchants who exchanged in goods to support communities of Maroons whose actions were much more like the communities of Maroons in Santo Domingo, Cuba, and Jamaica than uh, the context for slavery that by the early 1850s had, had come to define the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, four years after that, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe is inspired to write about the Dismal Swamp in a novel that she titled Dread, A Tale of the Great Dismal Swamp. And in that same year, uh, in September of that same year, 1856, David Hunter Strother uh, entered the Dismal Swamp accompanied by two enslaved boatmen in an attempt to uh, engage with the swamp's landscape and perhaps observe enslaved people in it. And he happened upon uh, uh, a man emerging from the underbrush whom he named Usman. Mm. Uh, Usman was an older gentleman uh, with graying hair. Oh, there's the image. That's great. <laughs> with graying hair that uh, was uh, clearly close to his head and with a graying beard uh, with muscular forearms, as we can see here, and muscular legs who seemed to be emerging from the swamp more so than he seemed to be an enslaved laborer compelled to work or, 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 or toil in the swamp. And we see here that he's also uh, armed with a long gun, uh, such that the suggestion of this image here, taken together with his clothing, uh, suggests that he lives in the swamp more so than he's enslaved by companies who operate in the swamp. He called this person Usman uh, because the two enslaved boatmen who were his uh, uh, guides in the swamp 
called this man Usman, but those two enslaved boatmen told David Hunter Strother no more about Usman. And so uh, when, of, when of course he emerged out of the swamp, uh, Strother uh, uh, sketched this image and submitted it to uh, Harper's uh, Weekly, where it was published. And it becomes perhaps the only image we have of a maroon in the Great Dismal Swamp. But I think it's a really good way of sort of capturing in an image the uh, the the way in which maroons in the Dismal Swamp captured abolitionists' imaginations by the 1850s. Yeah, it's a fascinating engraving, and and I've I've got a ton more questions for you, Marcus. But I've probably taken up enough of your time, at least for my own self. And I, you know, why don't we go to some audience questions and see what's on the mind of folks out there? Because it seems like we've got a very active uh, and eager crowd. And uh, this one actually came over email from Evan Turiano, uh, a graduate student to watch up there at the City, uh, City University of New York. And he asks, you know, did fugitive slaves in the Great Dismal Swamp threaten Southern slaveholding regimes in the 19th centuries in ways that shaped the coming of secession and civil war? First of all, hi, Evan. It's good to uh, hear that you're out there in the world tonight. I appreciate you joining us. Uh, you have raised a very interesting question, which I sort of dodged, quite frankly, in City of <laughs> Refuge, because uh, I was less interested in talking about the coming of the Civil War than I was in, in attempting to locate the history of Black resistance uh, and, and slave labor uh, in the Great Dismal Swamp prior to the Civil War. But that said, um, I think that if we imagine abolitionists making significant inroads in uh, moderate populations in the North uh, by pointing to the Great Dismal Swamp as an example of, of slavery's perpetuity, uh, slavery's expansion, not in the Cotton Kingdom, but in Virginia, in the Old Dominion, then I think that's one way that we can consider uh, both the persistence of slavery in the Great Dismal Swamp and, more importantly, the cholery, uh, the existence of fugitive slaves in the Great Dismal Swamp as shaping uh, mm -hmm. the of secession in the, in the Civil War. Uh, as it relates to the records that I have examined uh, firsthand, I don't necessarily see a lot of that evidence, but of course that's because I, I paid much less attention in City of Refuge uh, to the political uh, archives of this subject rather than the economic uh, and social archives of the subject. Well, that's great. Well, thanks very much for your question, Evan. And Kate B wants to know how tightly knit were these communities? Was it more of a, of a loose network of small groups or stronger communal organizations? In what way was housing and labor laid out or divided? Do we know anything about that? That's a really good question, Kate. Uh, good evening to you. Um, I have very much deferred to the archeologists on this question is the short answer. I cite a number of important archeologists who have been working in the swamp for a number of years. Uh, Daniel Sayers headlining uh, these folks and Ted uh, uh, Maris Wolf, a number of these important uh, scholars who have taken a closer look at perhaps uh, communal organization, um, uh, perhaps division of labor and the like in the maroon communities. That aside, I think that one thing that I can point to in your question is the way in which you frame your question around a loose network of small groups. In my research, that's what that's the conclusion that I've arrived at uh, to, to understand, to contextualize this history of petite marinage in the Great Dismal Swamp. There is little to no evidence of any significantly large groups on the scale of Clan Marinage and other places in the Atlantic world uh, to be found, at least in the existing archives of the Great Dismal Swamp. I'm very cautious to say no evidence completely because you never know what one might turn up, but at least that's the conclusion at which I've arrived. I've got a little bit of a follow-up actually to that question. I'm wondering, you, you mentioned archeologists, did you have an opportunity to go out on an expedition uh, as part of your project or simply working with uh, the scholarship that they have produced? I did. I actually joined uh, Dan Sayers' last field school in 2013. Uh, Dan Sayers is uh, uh, at American University uh, and he operated for several years before 2013, an undergraduate field school that each summer would, between May and June, 
uh, go into the Great Dismal Swamp to examine certain sites that he had identified in his own previous research as worthy of further research. And he uh, mentored a number of, of archaeologists and other young students whose works have begun to appear as well, including Becca Pajuto and Cynthia B. Good, both of whom I cite uh, in City of Refuge. Cynthia Good's uh, work in particular uh, is a really good look at the labor organization at Dismal Town and Dismal Plantation. And Becca Pajuto takes a, a broader look in some ways at the broader uh, artifact uh, record of the swamp. Uh, and then there's uh, other work that is forthcoming too that I think is very much worth attending. Uh, J. Brent Morris is an historian who's down in South Carolina who is due to publish a book uh, on the subject. And Catherine Benjamin Golden, who is now at the University of Delaware, is also publishing on the subject as well. well that's fantastic. Well, thank you, Kate, very much for your question. Uh, Lisa Crawley would like to know, did the community of Skeetertown, one of the communities just outside the Dismal Swamp, have any interaction or relationship with the en enslaved people there? I have to answer in a disappointing way, Lisa. Thank you for joining us. I, I, I don't know. Um, I didn't pay much attention to Skeetertown in uh, City of Refuge. It doesn't feature in City of Refuge. And so it would be presumptuous of me to sort of try to answer this question in, in any way more than uh, the truth is I just don't know. Sometimes we just got to pull out the I don't know card. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer H. would like to know, do you know of any African-American communities, towns, or organizations that were formed from maroon communities after emancipation? Uh, in Virginia, I'm not aware, although I know that there are now present day uh, organizations that are seeking to commemorate the history, the human history, the, the history of enslavement, the history of the Underground Railroad. Um, in the Dismal Swamp region. And the name of the most recent organization at the moment escapes me. So I would have to, to answer that question by email at a different time. But in the Caribbean, because there are descendant communities that are still very active today, there are a great number of examples of, of organizations that form out of descendant communities. Uh, one of the more recent ones uh, that comes to mind right away is the community at Charlestown in Portland Parish, Jamaica, uh, which uh, uh, in concert with scholars who have appointments at university stateside, uh, facilitate uh, and host uh, international scholars to come up to the mountain at a Safu yard uh, each year in June when it's possible to travel uh, for the International Charlestown Maroon Conference. Well, that's fantastic. And we've got another question coming in. And actually, this is something I've been wondering about is whether or not black loyalists of the American Revolution escaped uh, to the Maroon communities in the swamp. And were there many women in these communities? Gretchen, that's an excellent question. It is uh, part of the focus of my next work. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, there is evidence that um, former slaves who self-emancipated rather than uh, continue on with Lord Dunmore's party as it was chased up the Chesapeake Bay in 1775 and early 1776, or frankly, 1776, uh, rather than continue on with that party uh, that they diffused into the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, there was also some activity uh, around Great Bridge in 1775, and there were subsequent raiding parties too, British raiding parties, which entered the Dismal Swamp uh, in that same decade, in the 1770s. Uh, the question of how many women were in the swamp has always, quite honestly, vexed me. Uh, women do not show up in the 19th century business records of the Dismal Swamp much at all, at least in my, in my uh, estimation. Uh, the 1764 uh, a Dismal Swamp Company appraisal of enslaved people in the Dismal Swamp uh, does list uh, four or five women who were a part of that initial group of 54 who were in the swamp. Uh, and it also lists two children, at least two children who were in the swamp at that time as well. So there is some evidence of women in the swamp prior to the American Revolution. Uh, the trouble for me especially has been really attempting to uh, trace what happened to those women 
And that's one of the projects that I'm turning my attention to now. Well, the next question we've got coming in kind of dovetails actually very nicely into, into this. And, and Marie France would like to know, do we have any idea of how, how many individuals approximately were involved in, in the city of refuge? <laughs> Mary France, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the, the short answer is that it, the, the numbers are debatable. Mm -hmm. um, the city of refuge is a figurative uh, configuration that is an umbrella term that covers uh, the maroon spaces in the swamp and perhaps to the enslaved labor camps in the swamp. The numbers of maroons in the swamp is all but impossible to tabulate uh, in part because marinage was really uh, a means of remaining hidden. Mm -hmm. uh, maroons, that is to say, just did not want to be counted. They didn't uh, uh, stand in line for any census takers uh, when company agents were tasked with the duty of counting uh, enslaved people in the swamp. But land company agents were tasked with counting enslaved laborers in the swamp. And at various points, we find small groups of enslaved laborers uh, numbering about 10, maybe 20 in some instances. And we find over time, especially in the 1830s and leading up to the Civil War, uh, several hundred uh, enslaved laborers uh, in different sectors of the swamp at any given time in any given year. Uh, so my estimation would be that in the earlier years, prior to 1830, we're talking about much significantly less numbers. Uh, maybe one or 200 on an annual basis, depending upon the year. After 1830, the numbers rise to somewhere between 400 and 600 annually, depending upon the year. Uh, and over time, perhaps uh, 2,000, maybe 2,500, uh, perhaps more, depending upon how we count those numbers. But uh, as a social historian, I was uh, not exactly interested in population tabulations that were difficult to pin down. I have a similar experience in my own work trying to figure out how many you know people immigrated from Scotland on the eve of the revolution. And, and, and because of that, I, when you were talking, it sort of raises the question of my, in my mind of, of what, you know, to what extent do these numbers matter if the people who are reacting to a number that they can't possibly know, you know, that in turn is motivating their actions or their fears or, shaping the choices that they're making. Is that what you're seeing sort of going on here as well? Yes, yes, I would agree. Um, one enslaved person hiding in the swamp was too many for many of the local hamlets uh, whose very sense of security uh, was theoretically threatened uh, by an enslaved person hiding in the swamp. That there were small groups only amplified those fears. Um, and in, in particular contexts such as uh, in the wake of uh, Gabriel's uh, conspiracy in Richmond or the Easter conspiracy in 1802 in North Carolina uh, and Nat Turner's rebellion, those fears only spiked also uh, during the War of 1812 and of course during the American Revolution as well. Terrific, well, thank you. Thanks for indulging my follow-up there and thank you, Marie France. Uh, the next question is from Brian in uh, a very specific question about George Washington, whether or not he actually purchased enslaved people for the express purpose of working in the Dismal Swamp. Yes, uh, George Washington acquired um, a number of enslaved people to contribute to not only his share of enslaved people who were uh, to be sent into the swamp, but also to pick up uh, two more, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, enslaved people for another company member's share uh, in order to balance out uh, the difference. And we know this because uh, in that appraisal, of enslaved people sent into the swamp who were counted there in July 1764. Uh, there, there are a couple of different copies of this appraisal document. One of them penned in George Washington's hand and appended with a notation uh, that clearly designates uh, how George Washington uh, qualified his contribution plus the, the value of the contribution he picked up for the other company member. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Brian. That was a terrific question. And Walt actually speaks to our own moment. Uh, were there any d records of disease outbreaks and what impact may they have had in this space? Walt, that's an excellent and insightful question. The answer is uh, yes. 
in the uh, it's a bit difficult to pin into the swamp. Uh, but in the region of the swamp, there were a number of yellow fever outbreaks and other forms of bloodborne disease outbreaks, uh, particularly in the first decade of the 19th century. I, I read a series of letters between Richard Blow, who was a commission merchant based in Norfolk and Portsmouth, uh, and his various correspondents, uh, who were essentially questioning when they could expect vessels uh, in and out of Portsmouth and Norfolk. Uh, the transit of those vessels delayed by outbreaks of yellow fever and the like. And it's worth mentioning here, too, that uh, the sorts of insects which transmit disease, such as mosquitoes and ticks uh, and chiggers, are ubiquitous in the swamp. And I know this <laughs> from firsthand perspective. They are ubiquitous and they are voracious and uh even present day chemical insect repellents uh, don't stand a chance against some of the hung more hungry of these mosquitoes and ticks. But in the past, uh, the going local convention was to crush obscene amounts of garlic and put it underfoot in your shoes as an effort to at least fend off the mosquitoes from the ground uh, before they became airborne. I have not heard of that trick before. Now, that one was, was told to me uh, on a visit to the uh, North Carolina uh, Division of Archives and History. I have Earl Imes, who uh, worked there uh, uh, maybe 10 years ago. I'm not, I'm not sure if he's still there, but I have him to thank for that piece of local knowledge. That's fantastic. Well, Walt, thanks for your question. And speaking of archives, Marcus, uh, the final question comes from Scarlett and again sort of takes into account our present moment. And she's asking if you have any particular recommendations for doing primary source research during the COVID moment when so many archives are closed, any favorite online sites or resources for digitized archival material? Absolutely. Uh, this seems like a very good moment to, to mention uh, the University of Virginia Press's Rotunda Project. Uh, part of that Rotunda Project is sometimes uh, inaccessible due to paywalls, but I think during COVID, they have offered some sort of access to, to those records. Uh, that Rotunda project uh, has been very useful to me in terms of gaining access to uh, the records of George Washington in a wide range. Uh, part of my visit, my research to Mount Vernon when I was there in October was to get my hands on the actual letters that he and John Augustine Washington sent to one another. Uh, but I'd also uh, researched a number of those through the Rotunda Project. Uh, the Library of Congress maintains uh, a number of significant records of interest that relate to the Dismal Swamp uh, and other places. And I would also note that a number of research libraries at uh, major uh, universities do employ, albeit in limited staffs and with the requisite amount of time necessary to answer requests, uh, do uh, entertain requests sometimes to digitize sources uh, that you may have identified as being held in a particular archive uh, that would be useful to your research. That's terrific. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, Scarlett, if you are curious about additional resources, feel free to email the Washington Library. We can point you at different places as well. We'd be happy to do so. Um, Marcus, this has been a terrific conversation. I want to thank you very much for joining us this evening and answering all my questions, but more importantly, the questions from the audience. This has been great. Jim, I always appreciate it. This is, it's always a treat. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. And uh, once again, folks, if you want to pick up your own copy of Marcus's book, please do so. We'll drop a link in the comments to that. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Nebius, to so stay safe up there in Rhode Island. And thanks to all of you out there who have joined us this evening. We look forward to welcoming you back to Mount Vernon uh, sometime soon. It is open, of course, on a limited capacity. So please do check us out. Uh, stay tuned for uh, the next couple of weeks when we'll have some exciting stuff. Again, check out www.mountvernon.org slash GW Digital Talks for upcoming programs. Just want to say a quick thanks to Sarah Steo and Jeanette Patrick for driving this, everything behind the scenes this evening. And to all of you out there, good night and good luck.